without active involvement of humanity in the usage of library. A library is a compulsory requirement for what you want to achieve. Right now, each and every part of the world, every human being is concerned with the environment. We need libraries that inspire human consciousness towards ecological democracy. One of the basic institutions we can use is a library. Then what you can achieve is your spatial consciousness. Let's move forward quickly. That is the methodology. The methodology is very simple. We used textual analysis or scriptural analysis. It has previously been used as well. It was used by Karl Marx to explain capitalism and to predict capitalism. It was also used by Umberto, Umberto Ego to explain cryptocracy. Move forward quickly, my time is over. Those are our final and preliminary findings. Uh, African cultural and literature scholars are not actively involved in geospatial literature, geospatial consciousness, as per the evidence established at the Regional Center for Mapping and Resource Development. Because none of them is talked to there. None of them is established there. You get the books there talking about the winter and the summer and the autumn. You want to eat a bread or a cake or a tea without sugar. What is winter? If you can define it for me, I just want to pick one common person there. What is an autumn? So you cannot explain African climatic challenges by using words like autumn, winter, summer. Those are not environmental cultures of Africa. Lastly, last page, let's, let's think like that. Let's entice literature, let's entice libraries for the purpose of producing literature which protect the earth. There is a, a word in red there, saiporecha, saipo, saiporecha. The word saiporecha was, was neologized, was introduced by Ngukiwa uh, Fiongo, meaning a book you read on a phone, a text you read on the internet, a text you read on the laptop. Saiporecha. Literature is printed in terms of paper, but saiporecha is a book on WhatsApp page, a book on Instagram. You can be reading your special literature on your WhatsApp. I encourage you. I don't want to come up because I have more read late. May God bless you, and I thank you for coming, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Alexander, uh, your special themes in art. Um, I hope you've noted your questions down. Uh, you will take them after the upcoming two presentations. A little bit intense, but allow them more time because I nearly have two more presentations. I think we shall have enough time to undertake them. So the next presenter will be uh, Maxford Malumbua, and he will be presenting on uh, Mapping of his cage culture, suitable science in Malawi. Welcome. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. I will be presenting on the topic showing on the uh, slide. Uh, as it is rightly said, I am coming from Malawi. Uh, next slide. The background of uh, the, the presentation that I'm making, or I'll make, is, uh, is that uh, in Malawi we have uh, uh, fish that we are relying on as uh, an, an important animal protein source. It has been as an important animal source for uh, years now. Uh, most of the locals cannot afford uh, to buy uh, the other animal protein like chicken, uh, beef, goat, but most of them rely on small species of uh, fish. Uh, so with that regard, we have relied on uh, 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 capture fisheries for quite so long, but now the landings or the uh, catches from the capture fisheries are now going down. And this has been the concern of the government and of course the stakeholders. And this has uh, prompted the government to uh, seek, supplement uh, ways on how we can uh, continue having the supply of fish on the market. And one of the ways was to venture into uh, aquaculture or fish farming. So at first, we uh, looked at uh, 
fish farming as uh, pond-based aquaculture systems, which climate change has also uh, uh, impacted us negatively, as most of the ponds that we were relying on are now becoming uh, 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 annual, because most of them were relying on uh, diversions of water from rivers, and these rivers are no longer having water throughout the year. So we are having a number of ponds that are drying up, and that has also affected the fish production. And due to that, we have uh, uh, thought of uh, bringing in the climate smart agriculture systems, in this case, uh, the cage uh, system. Of course, uh, there are a number of them, but the one that uh, I'll talk about is the cage gadget system. But now, uh, it is easy to start a site, a construction site, uh, when it is on the background, because you are able to see. But uh, for Kichigacha, we have to assess uh, an area in the Iraq, uh, in this case, Lake Malawi, uh, where you have to understand what is the depth, what is uh, the, 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 the uh, water quality parameters of the area, what are the species in the area, uh, and what are the other conditions in terms of the sociological aspects of the area. So this has prompted us to uh, conduct what we are calling the uh, uh, zoning, cage gacha zoning for specific areas. So this presentation will be uh, uh, about what we have done in as far as zoning of cage uh, gacha is concerned in one of the areas uh, in Salima district uh, 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 for cage uh, gacha. Uh, next slide. Uh, from that background, we drew several specific objectives. Uh, the first one was to establish the physical and the chemical characteristics of the site. And the other one was to uh, determine the speech composition and abundance of the site. We would like to understand what was there before the, the, the coming of the cages, and of course follow up as, as to what will be there after 10 years or 20 years when we install the cages. Uh, then thereafter, we also uh, looked at to uh, we also looked at the, the bathymetry of the area and came up with the bathymetry maps of the area to see exactly where exactly within the site can we position the uh, cages. Then thereafter, we looked at the acceptability of the projects. Uh, in this case, the cages, because we don't want to have conflicts between the investors and the communities around the, uh, the, the uh, potential sites. And lastly, we also provided the recommendations of whether the area is suitable for uh, cage culture or not. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are several, uh, uh, object, uh, several methods that we uh, employed to achieve each of the specific objectives that I talked about. Uh, however, because of time, let me just uh, give you a picture of what was done. Uh, we collected uh, uh, the species from the landings of the fishers around the area uh, to determine uh, the biodiversity and, of course, the species composition of the area, uh, 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 length and weight measurements of the fish in the particular area were uh, recorded, length to the nearest um, millimeter and the weight to the nearest gram. We also collected uh, uh, information on uh, depth stations, on, on the transits that we formed from uh, on, on the site. I'll show you the transits that we uh, had on the site. And uh, we also conducted water quality uh, analysis uh, by collecting water samples in the same trans, the, the, the same transits that we were uh, co collecting the depth of the area. We also uh, co conducted, uh, uh, collected substrates and the uh, bifivores by using a grab sampler. And of course, we conducted a uh, focus group and of course, one-on-one -on -one interviews with the uh, communities around the uh, sites, proposed sites. Uh, coming to the results, uh, we had uh, the, the, the uh, results in the, in the, in the, in the figure one, uh, showing that uh, the depth of the area ranged from zero to 21, and the slope of the area uh, was, uh, uh, the area was sloping uh, uh, to the center, and uh, the uh, figure two is the uh, transit that we made uh, in the area that we were 
uh, uh, sampling or working on. Uh, next slide. Uh, from the uh, bathymetry map that we came up with, we uh, found that there were two sites that were uh, good or appropriate for catch culture, and these we we, we we named them as uh, area A and uh, area B. And uh, for area A, uh, the surface area was uh, 200, I mean 352 hectares, and the site B, the surface area was 265 uh, hectares. Um, the site that we recommended for uh, for, for, for Ketch Gacha was site A. Uh, the reason being that it was away from uh, uh, the tributary that we were having in the in, in the in the in the proposed site, because that tributary was also uh, bringing in uh, siltation and uh, reducing the, uh, the 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 depth of uh, the area around the area B. So we thought the investor might have some challenges in uh, setting up cages in that area. But however, at the point of uh, 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 the study, the two sites were uh, eligible for uh, cage culture. The water quality parameters uh, in table one were within the, uh, the, 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 within the favorable conditions for uh, fish survival. And uh, uh, we also concluded that uh, the area could also uh, uh, accommodate fish in cages because the fish are already living in the conditions that are appropriate for survival. Uh, the next slide. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the fish composition of the area, we uh, observed that there were three species that were so eminent in the area, uh, one of it being the Yungosabi sadera, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very uh, small uh, species, which is uh, uh, at the moment contributing uh, about 60% of uh, annual landings of the of the of our, of our country. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have also uh, Olochromis shiranas and Olochromis kalongai. Now, looking at our policy, we our lake Lake Malawi does not uh, I mean have a lot of species in one place, and it is the only lake in the world that has uh, over seven, se 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 700 species in one species, in, in one area. And due to that, there are several treaties that were uh, signed were with uh, uh, the with, uh, World Heritage Center. We have Lake Malaya National Park in the same lake. And due to that, we do not allow uh, catch of exotic species. So this study, we were happy to see that in the area, the species of targets for these cages, which is Olokolomi Shiranas and Olokolomi Skalongari, were already living in the area and were already successful in the area. Therefore, it would be easier or it would be possible to catch them also in cages. Um, the communities, 90, uh, over 90% of the communities also recommended for the project or the, 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 the coming in of the cages uh, with a different uh, expectations uh, of improving their livelihood in terms of employment, in terms of food, among others. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking at the uh, uh, conclusion, uh, we looked at several issues, but in conclusion, uh, we uh, found that the area was deep enough for catch culture, and uh, we also uh, noted that the depth, uh, I mean the distance, between, I mean, from the uh, from the shore to the sites, where within uh, uh, within range, it was manageable to uh, operate the cages or, uh, uh, or conduct hands but the practice to the cages uh, through at that particular distance. The water quality parameters were within the recommended uh, range for the survival of fish, and uh, uh, we also uh, uh, noted that. Uh, Uh, the water was, the, was, was productive, uh, of course not that productive as it is expected of a large lake, which, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which, which has a lot of uh, recycling, but we recommended for uh, uh, several aspects that would assist in that. One of them, next slide, one of them being that we should, they should allow 
uh, use of uh, uh, floating feed so that we do not uh, uh, encourage feed wastage, uh, which will result into uh, deterioration of water quality parameters. And the other recommendations that were made uh, were that uh, where that the water quality, water quality parameters should be uh, conducted, uh, should be monitored throughout the production site of the, uh, of the, of the cages so that we continue monitoring uh, what the cages uh, are, are impacting to the environment and make sure that we uh, deal with the, uh, the, 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 the challenges that come uh, thereof. And uh, lastly, the, 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 lastly, the uh, policy makers should also ensure that uh, 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 the, 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 uh, the, the investors are hold accountable in ensuring that they uh, are ensuring that they are, are covering or dealing with the challenges that are there in ensuring that uh, the environment is kept as it was uh, within the recommended range of uh, water quality parameters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maxford. So from land cover to polyphonic art to eating fish, now we are going to biodiversity reporting by Dudston. Let's now get the statistics right, I think. So. Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to, great to see you all. I appreciate you staying awake and attentive. It's been a full day. Um, I'll be talking a little bit today about biodiversity reporting. Um, and I'd like to start with um, introducing the lead author for this paper. And so Mike Gill is actually the, um, the lead for this initiative. He's with an organization called NatureServe. Uh, NatureServe uh, was originally part of the Nature Conservancy, and then many years ago, they actually uh, broke out to just focus on biodiversity analytics and endangered species information. So in the United States, uh, all of the sensitive data around species in each state is managed under a natural heritage program. It's obviously very sensitive and secure information, but the national data set for the, the whole uh, country is compiled by NatureServe. So they actually have this trusted role with the federal government to take this uh, sensitive data from each state. They have all of those partnerships and relationships, and then they provide that open data set. Um, not open. They provide that data set for regula regulation and policy at the national level. They also work around the world, uh, helping to implement similar systems uh, in, in, in many different programs. So Mike is the director of Biodiversity Indicators Program. He's, he's um, an honorary fellow of the UN Environment World, WCMC World Conservation Monitoring Center and the former chair of the group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network. Um, so forgive me because I will be reading a little bit today um, because again I'm presenting on, on Mike's behalf. Um, so there is a major initiative around the world that's emerging to better track biodiversity and species data. That's part of the um, community of practice and the global biodiversity framework. Um, that was intended to be released in 2020. Things got delayed through COVID. And so this December, those new indicators for reporting uh, how each country will be reporting on the status of the, the conservation, wildlife, biodiversity, the health of the environment, that will all be finalized as far as how we'll manage and measure that for the next 10 years, let's say, eight years, depending on how they adjust for this delay. So countries as, uh, are parties to a number of biodiversity-related multilateral agreements, but that means there's now a new reporting challenge, a new burden of tracking all of these indicators. Um, so the SDGs, the space, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, likely many of you are aware of, have 169 targets. And so just the amount, the effort to compile and do that reporting is, is not trivial. Um, so the, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which we again will see out released in, in, in December, and Mike has been part of the committees that are helping uh, understand and advise on what those indicators will be, um, that's a new opportunity and it's also a challenge. 
Now, um, we are, as you've heard throughout this conference, we are in the midst of a big data revolution. There's more and more satellites, there's more and more sensors. Um, you know, there's, there's reporting that 90% of all information ever generated was created in the past two years. Um, so how do we make sense of it? How do we translate this incredible amount of data to actionable decision making uh, around conservation? Uh, we know the need is there. During the most recent Global Science for Biodiversity Forum, uh, we conducted a survey uh, with the participating countries and over 92% said they currently lack that ability to, to do that recording, reporting. So the, our concept and our collaboration with NatureServe and the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data is to take existing technology, established technology, and to implement toolkits that we can quickly make available and deploy in multiple countries. Uh, we'll start that with a pilot level initiative, but it's not a small pilot. It's actually across six different African countries. But the goal here is to have these national toolkits that are structured around well-defined workflows, including obviously mapping the data, doing analysis, and reporting on the indicators out through dashboards. And then we'll back that up with training and technical documentation and refining that pattern of use so that we can move it from place to place, from country to country around the world. Um, so clearly um, our work has been to define those information management needs, come up with the repeatable toolkit, and then to advance um, the deployment of those tools in a way that's effective and, and scalable. A little bit hard to read, I apologize. Um, here's an example of uh, how this approach is being applied at the national scale. Um, we'll see the workflow um, for the production of multiple indicators that speak to ecosystem extent, connectivity, and integrity, as well in, as, well as guiding priorities for protection and restoration. Uh, based on the Red List of Ecosystems methodology. Uh, that was pioneered in South Africa. Uh, South Africa is one of our partners in this uh, National Toolkit Initiative, and it's, the approach has been applied in a number of other African countries, including Malawi, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Uganda. So this approach takes a, set, a small set of core indicators, protected areas, uh, land cover, uh, time series data, land use, and then that derives ecological condition and land and vegetation classification to produce a biodiversity assessment level. And that then feeds the ability to report out on multiple indicators. So in short, we're trying to go from having a bunch of different tools that you could compile and put together to accomplish something similar into a more of an organized toolkit. Right? The tools are well defined, the data, uh, once you have the data coming in, whether that is national data, whether that is data from Esri's Living Atlas, um, uh, many different sources, you're, you're hearing about many different uh, organized data providers through the course of this event, Digital Earth Africa, Biopama, many others, that you can then bring that data forward in a way that's integrated to produce this um, reporting capability at, for all of these emerging indicators. So what this looks like in practice, this is a spatial biodiversity assessment um, that the South African uh, National Biodiversity Institute led in partnership with NatureServe um, and, and Ugandan experts to guide a strategic prioritized conservation and restoration effort uh, in Uganda to reach various targets including a 2025 forest cover target. So the approach is simple. It can be pr produced with either global or national data, and it produces scalable outputs that align not only with the global targets, but also national development uh, policies. Um, let's see, here's um, the toolkit will um, contain, again, customized dashboards like the ones you're seeing here. These are some related um, biodiversity monitoring dashboards that NatureServe has developed for other regions. Um, including the, Ar the, the, the Arctic. Um, let's see. This, um, so again, sort of what's in the toolkits? Um, we're talking about we're data, tools for analytics, 
the dashboards themselves, so those don't need to be crafted and, and designed, through, designed through custom software uh, efforts, but rather designed through custom software development, but rather configured. That's a big part of Esri's technology today is rather than starting with building blocks and code and building an application, you start with an application and you change it slightly. Uh, it makes things much, much more efficient. Um, tools, training, um, engagement with the, with the country partners and sort of reinforcing um, this pattern and building capacity around deploying it. Um, the technical partners um, include ESRI, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data that I mentioned. Um, the overall initiative involves eight countries, um, six in Africa, uh, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Namibia, and Tanzania, uh, including Zanzibar. And the goal is to establish these, uh, work with these partners in the first phase, and in the second phase, further refine and deploy uh, the availability of these tools in a, in a, in a much larger community. Um, so I thank you, I uh, appreciate your attention, and would love to, to take any questions as, uh, as we get to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desden. Just to confirm, do you still have Walter around? No, so I think we have those four percent. Walter, you're here? Okay. So we'll get the president from Walter.
think as Walter uh, fixes his presentation, you can take the questions on the first four presentations as we wait for him to fix his uh, presentation. Let's begin with the first presentation by Hussein, which was about uh, protected areas. Anyone with a reaction on that, that Hussein can be able to note it down and respond? So we have one. Any other? Okay, proceed. Make it closer. My question is on the model that was used for prediction uh, of the year 2020. I guess I get to find out probably from the results they had what parameters uh, informed this. The parameters for modeling the land cover for 2050. Yeah. Okay. So, Sen, are you around? Okay, any other question for him so that he is able to combine the responses? Oh, you've forgotten the presentation? How would you forget so fast? Eh? In any psychology, when you, when you forget so fast, you are given a very funny name. I'll not mention it here. You know it? Any psychologist around? People who forget so fast, they are called what? Please respond. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marceline, for the question about uh, the prediction, which is very important. Uh, the model that was used um, was the Excel sheet. Uh, actually, we used the pivot table to come up with the answer for the prediction. And um, remember, for you to come up with the prediction, you have to, uh, you have to start with the initial year. Uh, and we had a series of uh, land cover maps and statistics right from uh, 1990, an interval of 10 years up to 2019. So we could um, subtract the initial year from the current year and be able to determine uh, the difference between the, the years. Actually, you can uh, subtract uh, from 2010, uh, from, uh, from 2019, you subtract 2019 for you to know each year what is changing and how much. Then uh, through the pivot table in Excel sheet, you are able to use the R square to do the prediction. So that was the methodology. But the variables, so basically what they just land use or anything else, but that, that I think is a question. What went into the, into the R model, whatever you're calling yeah. it? Okay. So, uh, some other indicators, uh, or we had to integrate with other uh, indicators such as rainfall, uh, mm -hmm. which is an indicator. Uh, we had to see the series from 1990. How has it been uh, uh, raining for that particular uh, uh, study area? Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's go to the polyphonic arts and the uh, geospatial literature. Any reaction for Mr. Alexander Opicho? You have one here. Any other hand for him? Polyphonic arts, transforming science into theater. Let's go. Okay. Allow me to ask uh, from the previous presentation. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, on the study area, I I got interested because of the stakeholders, uh, the ones who are involved, and uh, I saw uh, KWS and some other institutions, and I don't know what was the input of KSS on that. The input of KSS and uh, the end product, who is who's benefiting from this product currently? So Sam? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, it is evident that uh, uh, you can't separate uh, a forest and uh, a wildlife. They, they go hand to hand. Um, but uh, what uh, KFS uh, gave to us 
Actually, uh, the boundary you got from uh, Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, that is uh, some of the inputs that, that we got from uh, Kenya Wildlife Service. But for the output, uh, that is the results, we shared across uh, these government institutions, including Kenya, uh, Kenya Forest Service. So that's what we did. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Alexander before I move to caging? These cages. Hmm. You guys don't like drama, and you watch movies. All right, good. So, any question on the caging of fish in Malawi and the biodiversity systems within Lake Malawi? You said there were about 700 species of fish in that particular lake. So, fish caging is actually the new culture of fish harvesting in most. Marine states, including Kenya, we also do caging like Victoria and places like that. So it's actually the modern way of fish harvesting. Any reaction for him? Why are you done like this? Do you need some whiskey? Or some water? The weather is too cold, isn't it? And the whiskey is coming at around six. But if you are done like this, how will you? At six, there will be something bitter for the for the tongue. At six, it's six p.m. today. Don't leave. Uh huh. Reaction for the fish caging. Are you with me? Are you sure you are here? Why oh, are you quiet like that? Okay, let's go to Darcy then. Anything on biodiversity monitoring? You want to know anything about diversity monitoring? We have one there. Anyone else? Okay. Hello, hello. Uh, my question goes to biodiversity monitoring. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't capture the presentation clearly, especially on a political commitment to biodiversity data, both production sharing and the produ uh, production and the protection. Now, which level of government? You see it uh, in the governmental level, global governmental level, or which specific government? Can a uh, regional governmental commitment achieve the global results for biodiversity data production, protection, and circulation? That was uh, the question to my brother, God sent just one question like that, but his presentation was very brilliant, I've met in this year. Right. Uh, before you respond, God sent, there is a, a young man here who does not want to get a microphone and ask me a question, but he has a whispered in my ear. But now, can I get the document for your presentation? The answer is yes. You go to the Office of Regional Center for Mapping and Resource Development, which is organizing this conference. Find the administration. You will be given respective documents and you do your, your media reporting. But welcome very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Desmond. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate your question. So the, um, the biodiversity indicator framework that's coming in December is a nation to nation UN initiative. So the UN member states, so every, every country that's part of the UN system, which is almost every country, has been part of this nation to nation negotiation of scientists to come up with these national reporting standards. So in the case of this project, it's very much a nation to nation, a na national level endeavor. Um, now that's not to say that nature and biodiversity aren't important everywhere, even at the village level. Um, and so a separate, relate, a separate project that I wasn't speaking to today is some work that we've done with the Jane Goodall Institute, and they're working in Tanzania and Uganda around what they call Takare, and it's a community-based conservation approach where they go in and they listen to the community. What are the challenges? Maybe it's education, maybe it's health, maybe it's need for microfinance. And they develop um, focused programs with the community to resolve those issues. And then they do conservation. They talk about land use planning around the village. 
Where does the water come from? Where is the trees? And, and I, I really appreciated your presentation. One of the key aspects of Takare is they have performances and art where they have um, like posters, for example, where the, the area is completely deforested and there's barely any water in the stream and people are hungry. And there's another scenario where nature is lush and the food is productive, you know, the farms are productive and people feel, you know, look happier and they use, they use art to convey the importance of these, you know, concepts while they do Takari. So Esri Press has just published a book that the Jane Goodall team wrote and uh, we're very proud of it because it is, it is not sort of a top down, this is how you work with communities. It's actually the voices of the people that did the work. It's the Tanzanians, Ugandans, the folks in DRC that, that developed that approach. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. You know, one, one final thing I would add is that you can build a beautiful national dashboard uh, of information, but that information comes from the entire system. And so it's really important to invest in capacity and systems in, in regional governments, in counties, right? Rolling up so that you're rolling up something credible. And there's a lot of work to do in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Another reaction? Okay, quickly. Yeah, then I'll come back to you. Okay, my question goes to Mr. Oficho, because yeah, sure. I heard him complaining that nobody asked him a question, so I have two for you. You said in your analysis of African literature, you are trying to look at the themes of geospatial themes, actually. So I am interested to know, in your analysis, did you find that the current African literature, does it have that aspect of communicating about space, biodiversity, environment, and our ecology, and or it doesn't have anything to do with your special themes. Two, do you think before GIS technology and before talking of your special as a term, did our African literature have that aspect of talking about our cosmology in terms of in their vocabulary, in their literature, in their songs, and other things. In that respect, I wanted also to know, because you said you, I assume you're coming from Uganda, isn't it? So you must have read Chindu by Jennifer Makumbi, a novel which details generation across 200 years, you know that. And in it, it talks about Kampala before Europeans came, when they came, and after they left. And it, it, it sense of gives us an imagery of what was there before when they arrived and when they left, it's like a satellite image. How the city looked like, the environment, when they arrived and when they left. So do you also think such a novel can be said to have an idea of your special themes? And then in Kenya, we have M.P. Olekule. He had a novel called Vanishing Hearts, which talks about what happens when the environment is destroyed, the climatic changes, unpredictable rains, drought, famine, and such kind of things. So I know I have said many things. I said it because I also have interest in literature, and I was wondering, you were complaining, nobody asked you a question, so I decided to give you that service, sir. Thank you. Let's go, Peter. Make it a brief, please, and pass us to the point, because you have another presentation pending. Thank you very much. I will be as brief as required. Let me know the name of my friend who has asked the question. Your name was? He just asked Kimboy. Oh, thank you, Bwana Kimboy. Uh, you had uh, four questions. One of them was whether I come from Uganda or not. Uh, that was the most difficult question. To be sure, I don't have an answer. Sincerely. Sincerely, I promise I don't have an answer. But I'm aware of Jennifer Nasumbuka Magumbi, the author of Chindu and the Ali Woman. Uh, there are two, there are favorite your special themes in the works of Jennifer Nasumbuka Magumbi. Her work is Kintu. Uh, when you pronounce it as Pakiswahili accent, you say Kintu. 
that K in Luganda is G. You say Chindu. So Chindu, the Kapaka, the Kapaka Saka. We have a lot of, a lot of geospatial theories in Chundi's narrative. The other book, The Ari Woman, he talks of the ant hills, the rain, the whales drying, the grains disappearing, the herbs not being there, their husband beating their wife because she didn't collect firewood in time. Those are geospatial issues, okay? Now, what I'm saying is we have a lot of uh, African uh, literatures discussing geospatial issues, but the problem is where are they in the geospatial library institutions? That was the pregnant issue here. Again, uh, Henry Ole Kulet, all of his works from the blossoms of the savannah, the vanishing hearts, and many, many other works he did, what around 11 works, which are all geospatial in context. You understand? Uh, Henry Ole Kulet is the only African literary scholar and a practitioner who came up with a brand of literature called Savannah, Savannah literature. So Savannah is a geospatial word. Uh, ultimately, I agree that uh, Henry Ole Kulet is a geospatial author. This is my question. Do you find him in your library? If you can go and look around, where you work and where you work, I'm sure we don't have Henry Ole Kulet on the shelf. Uh, the, uh, the Regional Center Library is, it is a geospatial library. So it has technical, moral, professional, and a technical application to have those type of stuff on the, on the, on the fiction, art, drama, and the polyphonic section of, uh, of the library. That was your last question. Your first question was, uh, if there are geospatial literature in Africa, we've already said yes. I don't need to, to repeat. Even Pinyavanga Wainaina was also a geospatial author. Ngugi in the grain of wheat, he talked about land, rain, and tilling, failure of productivity of the earth. That was geospatial connotations, okay? Uh, David Mailu, in the broken drum, he had like over 500 pages talking about the climate. No one gives him attention. That is geospatial literature. We don't have him in our shelves. So I was not given, I, I didn't have uh, time to go up to the uh, conclusions because of time economy. I want to agree that there are geospatial African writers who describe African climate in terms of African needs, not in terms of autumn, winter, spring, and uh, other stuff, but in terms of African experience of climate change. The problem is, institutional support and institutional promotion of geospatial African literature is the missing link in African geospatial civilization. You came up with a new word, cosmology and cosmogony. They have the same meaning, the origin of the earth and the experience of the earth in its history, cosmogony and cosmology. We have a lot of those theories, a lot of those themes in the, in, the, in the African literature. You remember my inspiring influence, my benchmark was Professor Sheikh Anda Job, the one I cited in my abstract and my introduction. He is an African, he was born in Senegal, he worked in the U.S. for some few months, uh, some few years, but he came back to work at Senegal. He established the Sheikh Anda Job University in Senegal. It is a very strong university to the level University of Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, and Makerere. Now, uh, he was not uh, writing to, uh, he was not writing GIS information. His focus was on uh, evolution of human beings, but using geospatial approach to explain human evolution. You've heard about Egyptology. Egyptology is a concept that all human beings came from Egypt. Now, Sheikh and Diop wanted to, to establish and, uh, and, 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 and confirm and approve this theory by, doing, by using the approach of geospatial data analysis. He confirmed that it has been accepted if you give me time to, 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 to come out. Uh, all human beings have an evidence of coming from Africa. Kindly summarize. He came from Egypt. 
So in Egyptology, is the proper explanation of, of African cosmogony and African cosmology. So yes, there is a geospatial literature in Africa, but institutional support of geospatial literature is lacking. I don't know if I come from Uganda. I'm not aware. Thank you. Okay. But the uh, last one here, then we have presentation for Walter. I, I think I had raised okay. my hand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask something on biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, the linkage between biodiversity and, and infrastructure when it comes to also conservation, uh, because uh, in most developing countries, there is a lot of infrastructure coming up, and we have uh, data on biodiversity. And the reason I ask about the link is because most of these institutions, infrastructural institutions, they might not refer to uh, the institutions dealing with biodiversity. By the time we realize the biodiversity is already destroyed. So that's why I wanted to uh, clarification whether we have data to show our, uh, the, how rich biodiversity is and where it is found and how it can be avoided, and especially to developing countries who are coming up with different infrastructure on a daily basis. A case study is in Kenya. A lot is happening, uh, more roads are being opened. Uh, how are we to conserve this biodiversity using GIS? I, I know we've used GIS to establish where these uh, areas are, but is this information useful to this or available to the institutions uh, dealing with infrastructure? Thank, Thank you. you. Good enough. That's done quickly on that. Yes. Or are you also on biodiversity? Okay, wait, hold on so that you combine the two. Here. These are the last questions, and then we have Walter making his presentation. Thank you very much. My question, David, is uh, <coughs> with the regard to the partnering counties or the counties that are involved in this whole project, I wanted to find out how is the implementation plan or model? Is it the same? And uh, I'm asking this with the specification to Kenya. Uh, the big data is still a quite new but very dynamic thing currently and very vital because we all know that uh, data is very important especially uh, in policy formulation and by extension implementation so i wanted to know the models if they are the same considering that in kenya we have uh, devolved governments uh, and in line with that also what are the plans on capacity building and especially to the devolved government units in our country thank you Excellent. Well, thank you for, for both questions. Uh, right now, for this pro pilot project we're talking about, it is a national level uh, in indicator reporting toolkit. Um, so the project itself will then lead to um, you know, sub-national engagement with the counties, uh, with the contributing agencies. So that, that, will come, that, will, that will come later once the project is underway. I do know, um, so to, to both questions, um, there is national level reporting. Um, there's also a lot of need for improvement. So I think the net last national assessment that I'm familiar with in Kenya, which I didn't work on, but, I'm, but I've heard of, required a nonprofit to go from county to county, nonprofit to nonprofit, and unlock data and then compile it into some shape files, right? So it's not an efficient way there isn't a live current view of biodiversity in Kenya or most other countries. That's where we need to get to. So all of the tools and technologies that you're learning about here, um, county level initiatives that do good uh, conservation planning at the county level, rolling up to the opportunity to do national level conservation planning. Um, there is another initiative that's taking hold around the world, which is called 30 by 30, over 90 countries have committed to 30 by 30, and that is conserving 30% of land and water in, in each of these countries by the year 2030. So how do you do that? Where are the best places? How do you continue to grow with appropriate infrastructure and not destroy the environment where it's not absolutely necessary? Those require organization of, of geospatial data 
and, and, and trust in that data um, and tools for conservation planning. So that's the challenge ahead. I don't want to imply that we have all of the answers. I think we know a lot about the technology and the practices that can help get us there. But a lot of this work I'm describing is sort of what needs to come next. Thank you. All right. Thank you, President. Thank you. We'll now allow Walter to make his presentation on uh, Nairobi. Nairobi is one of the few cities with a national park, a forest, and now it has a grazing area. The, the land cover land is changed that Walter will want to show us. Welcome, Walter. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'm Walter, and uh, I'll be brief to the point. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, a topic on changing land use and land cover uh, in the areas that are being utilized by pastoralists in the city of Nairobi. So uh, I've been doing this work. It's part of uh, the work we have been uh, working on on pastoralists. And uh, it's just a small portion which we have worked on and we feel like uh, it's worth presenting with Oliver from the University of Nairobi. So, uh, first of all, uh, we know they are a very important part of the economy. And uh, in Kenya, they are really facing a myriad of challenges, uh, key of them being changing land use and land cover. And um, uh, when we come to Nairobi, you realize that Nairobi City uh, is currently one of the cities in Africa which are experiencing uh, rapid urbanization, changing land use, and uh, even population. The industries are expanding and uh, to the neighboring areas, and uh, you realize that uh, people are settling from different backgrounds, and uh, the issues that are here really Contrary. Contrary to the expectation that pastoralists will be moving away from the city, in the work we have been doing, we realize that pastoralists are even moving more closer to the city due to various reasons. And among the findings, which might not be under this one, uh, is because of uh, uh, reduction in grazing land, where they have been settling due to changes in land cover and land tenures. Uh, they're also moving in search of various opportunities. Among them, uh, you realize they're seeking employment alongside following their hearts. So uh, the work of this, uh, the aim of this work was um, <coughs> to build on the previous work by quantifying the land use and land cover changes uh, in the grazing areas within the city and bring up intervention efforts that will address uh, the issues that are revolving around pastoralism. Uh, modern science and technology has been criticized for uh, overlooking the role played by local communities, among them the pastoralists, to involved in sustainable resource management. And for this reason, uh, it came, uh, scientists came up with uh, the participatory GIS, which I call the PGIS, whereby they are being involved to bring out the change detection of what they have been experiencing for the specific resources they use. Um, in our case, and uh, this is the methodology, we hope you can see. If you can't, uh, we involve pastoralists to sketch or to draw mental resource maps, whereby in these maps, they were able to give us the key resources they are using in Nairobi and how these resources have been changing. And from my study, I realized that uh, pastoralists have been staying in the city since early 1990s. So for this case, we went ahead to uh, check how this change has been taking place uh, in the span of 10 years. Uh, we, did, we did the study in 2020, so 2020, 2010, and the year 2000. So uh, the span of 10 years was sufficient enough to give the change detection. And uh, the three mental resource maps were drawn from 
uh, four various uh, locations uh, where persons have settled, which we call them uh, the Manyatas. Even here in Kasaran, down here, we have a very big Manyata. And uh, these maps uh, were taken image, and that image was digitized, georeferenced uh, using ArcGIS version 10.8 and uh, used uh, to provide our findings. So we realized that the grazing area, uh, the bare land area increased at uh, the alpha level of uh, 0 0.05 and uh, the overall grassland and forest area also reduced uh, at that same alpha level between 2020 and uh, 2000, the 20 year period of study. Um, there was rapid expansion of real estates, industries, factories, uh, settlement areas. Uh, also, we had infrastructure blocking the grazing routes and even the areas uh, these parcels are grazing. For your information, our, our main uh, international airport, their parcel is there. So, when you be leaving, Begin, you will be able to see them. They are always grazing there. And there is a very big bomber uh, consisting of 86 households. So the question is, should we assume them? Or should we look into the efforts to know what is bringing them to the city and address that? Next slide, please. Uh, this was one of the outputs. And uh, it is in uh, Kasarani sub-county, it's called Oloropil Manyata. So the, 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 the right side is the recent map drawn for 2020. Then we have the 2010, then we have the year 2000. You can see how resources are changing. Those uh, dotted lines, they are settling areas where these parcels are settling. So you realize that there are so many compared to uh, in the year uh, 2000. So they have been increasing. You can even see the roads. And things are changing. Things are changing. They are being chased away from the city. Yet, when you walk with them, you realize that they believe every green is theirs. Uh, from our conclusion, uh, we realize that uh, rapid land use and land cover changes have taken place in the city. and. Uh, because of that, pastoralists are facing triple challenges from grazing, movement, and even uh, being able to accommodate themselves within the city. Some of them have resolved to neighboring areas in Kiambu, Machakos, and even some uh, have even invented their way of surviving by buying pastures. So there's an issue of commercialization of fodder, and all this, uh, as we have seen, and even by moving closer to the city, settling there, we say that they are moving towards the policy makers who are living within the city to be able to bring out their cry, which needs to be heard. Yes, please. So uh, we propose uh, various strategies, among them improvement of uh, uh, commercial fodder within the city, uh, this is a very lucrative business area, and uh, we have several people who love uh, livestock meat. So when we bring fodder to them, they'll be able to feed the animals. But the question is, towards the city or not? Uh, we also uh, suggest quantification of the national pasture resource base uh, so that we can be able to address and bring out the measures which can address uh, they are grazing so that they either should not come towards the city, but they should be supplied with food so that uh, their livestock with feed so that they can be able to uh, graze in those areas. We also need uh, to map their grazing patterns, uh, how they, they have been moving seasonally, and uh, this is a continuation of the work they have been doing. And uh, in the variations of the pastures, we'll be able to uh, address uh, the need to uh, to help them uh, overcome their challenges. So uh, this study is having several beneficiaries and uh, 
because it's a continuing work, we recommend that uh, the land use planners, the policy makers in the government sector, the livestock uh, departments, including uh, International Livestock Research Institute, uh, Caldro Ministry of Agriculture, Caldro is Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization, and uh, including RCMRD, who are part of the research institutes, uh, should come up and assist the pastoralists in urban areas to address the challenges they are experiencing. Uh, so I expect your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Now we know that uh, the owners of the Robert are claiming it's back. They uh, welcomed modernization and now it has chased them away. Any reactions for Walter? If any? I have one. Where is your hand? I see it. Okay, please go. Did you get the questions correctly? Whether it is sustainable and the governance structures, I think the key points there. Thank you for the reactions. Uh, about sustainability of pastoralism in the city, uh, we realize that uh, pastoralists have been increasing, and it is contrary to our expectation. But the problem is they are facing various challenges, even in the places they are coming from, which are not being addressed. So they are finding that the only way is to come to us. So uh, about the sustainability, it's not assured. But about even their, uh, the place where they have come from, there's a lot of issues, land degradation, overgrazing, regeneration of pastoralism. And you realize that all those factors are making pastoralism in the entire country to be unsustainable. So about sustainability, it's no longer about urban areas, it's about even the uh, areas we're coming from. About uh, the set of questions of some uh, government intervention, governance, uh, the issue of governance, the county and uh, national governance, uh, they haven't had a lot of investment in pastoralism, despite it being the major sector providing over 75% of the national uh, livestock, the government sector has neglected it. And that's why we are bringing this close to the attention of the uh, researchers, the policy makers, that they should look upon them, or else pastoralism is running extinct in the country. Just as you can look at the literature, uh, by the way, the, the same issue of urbanization, uh, pastoralist put in urban areas have been reported in Tanzania. And also, it's okay, it's facing the same challenge. From the literature, I realize that pastoralism is at the peak of extinction. So, governance and everything is our role to help pastoralism. Thank you. Any other? We have another one there. So, you have two, so there and another. And I have the last hand, if any, so that we close the QA. So one, two. Who's the last one here? Only two. Okay. Go. Thanks for your presentation. Um, the moderator alluded to the fact that Nairobi is quite unique in having a national park, um, but I didn't see that included um, in your study. Was there a particular reason for not factoring in the impact of having a large protected area in the city and the relationship of that to? open spaces, etc. Um, another thing is you mentioned, you just mentioned Tanzania. So in 
the study did this come up that there are some socioeconomic factors like transhumanists, etc., which are causing um, pastoral, like, pastoralist communities to be pushed out of the places they live in. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Can we combine them? So we have a hand here, and then you finally finish. Let's finish with that. It's closer. Well, uh, I think uh, in all the presentations that we have seen, that have been presented, we have seen that uh, the guy understands what uh, is required. I was so much touched when you say that the pastoralists are engaging the policy makers. It's good, it's true, but I want to ask you, according to the stuff that we have done, is it implementable? Two, is it only Nairobi? Because we have other major cities that are pastoralists in the region, so that's all. Okay, let's combine it with this that you can have one response. From the FGD's discussion, we expected you to tell us that these were the challenges that made the pastoralism to move to the city. But however, you also should seek solutions from the same FGDs if they are moving to the city. What can we do to stop them from moving to the city? Because as most policymakers, you make policies from the desk, you don't know what's on the ground. If I am forced to move to the city, what can what can they do so that they can remain the what in this? Mind you, these pastoral lands were also okay, like any other land, but they kept on degrading themselves by themselves. It's not the government that has been degrading the pastoral land. So how can I, how can they regenerate their land so that they can continue living on the same land as they used? Not again tasking policymakers to look for avenues of helping the degrader. You come and destroy your vegetation. Then tomorrow you say, we need assistance. Now, where will the assistance come from when I've already destroyed? We call these people, we are born in these lands. These are their native ones, their lands. So when you conduct an FGD, you ask for a challenge, the problem. Then at the same time, ask them, since time the memorial, your ancestors have been living here. So what can we do to maintain you on the same what grounds? Because moving to Kampa, moving to Nairobi, and even the government task to give solutions to, to the pastoralists, it's not solving anything. We are reading all of these papers. Then my other question goes to biodiversity. There's a, a goal of achieving biodiversity by 2030. But tell me in memorial, like for instance, I come from Uganda. In 1994, we had a vegetation cover of 46%. Right now, we have 1.9 million acres standing. And as I, I might say, we have less than 1.91 acres. But you are saying, by 2024, the biodiversity should have what? Increased. Have you taken up the, the people who have gone on reducing the biodiversity? Because this is not the first time. This is not the first land use on biodiversity. If you go to literature, there is a lot of biodiversity increase. But you find those are paperwork that have been degraded by ELEX. But the people who are degraded, people who are destroying the biodiversity, they actually don't know. I can give an example of Mount Ego. There is a lot of landslides in Mount Ego. But you ask them, your great grand is lived here, and they, they, they do not experience the landslides. But why is it now landslides are the god of the world? I can give an example of Marina. I was in Marina. I tried to do a value of Marina to attach Marina. There is someone who come. I cut the tree because God was 
God give us, gave us to us. So for until we come and change the mindset of the people, the, the custodians of the, the, the natural capital, the natural resources, we are going to write papers. People, we are going to read. So and so wrote this about this. So and so wrote about climate change. So and so wrote about um, pastoralism. But you are not solving. Soon pastoralism will be on the streets of what? Healing to when they are also struggling. Tell them to give us solutions. From their solutions, we shall begin from them. But if you are not making the first solutions for people to read, I think the conference should be changed. We should bring in the people to find the resources so that the people to change the what? The policies. But if you say you are making a policy for me who is living in the SC, eh? and I'm the only who understands the policy, the person who is in the village, but understanding the policies. So you will say, This is what I know. So thank you very much. Okay. Walter, try, try and respond on what you know. Thank you for... <laughs> yeah, you could see the questions were beyond some yeah, of them. Thank you for the relevant observations. Uh, they are really building on what? Uh, uh, my learned friend here has said, uh, has asked about, uh, uh, I didn't mention, I got the National Bank. Actually, pastors uh, who are already around the airport, they are the ones who enter the park. But the park is restricted by Kenya wildlife service, AWS. So entering there, they shall enter there during dry seasons. When there is no forage at home, they come to have this which of their uh, rice zone grazing itself. So uh, by entering there, they realize that the only potential is within the city, even along the road any green they can find. So it's just a triple problem. And the triple problem is what I've been trying to do, that the solutions might not come from the road itself. We have to look outside. But outside, land is getting degraded. People are looking for land for settlement. There's a lot of land uh, privatization. There's a lot of uh, uh, conversion into other uses, like uh, mechanical and industrial systems. And pastors are losing their land. There's nobody who is looking into that. So the issue, we can say that we have to bring the voices, pastors, uh, on service. And let these speak by themselves, nobody is going to them. We are representing them here, but they are not here. Uh, again, I realize that they are moving, the pastors are moving across the border, even Tanzania. It is it's no longer a one way direction, but for the city, that was a special case that was bringing attention to me. And I followed by moving to our, uh, my learned friend uh, who asked about whether this is going to happen in Nairobi. The, the answer is no. Actually, go to Nigeria, go to Kisumu, go to uh, Mombasa, the other areas. Most cities in the, in the country here, first of all, are moving towards other areas. It's no longer about accessing the social services, but they are also in need of market. The resources are not there at all. They are just intertwined. So as we are doing research, one of my recommendations was we have to establish a database of pasta uh, across the country and we are updating, let's say, uh, during the crisis zone, during this period, we should have a database that should indicate this is the national uh, pasture resource. This is what, what was planted, the natural, and at least uh, consolidated in a way that it can be used to provide more forage for these others. And that one will actually attend the movement to the city. Certainly, the city is not the last result, but uh, they are just bringing even more problems into uh, their lives. Uh, about the refugees, sir. Uh, the refugees were used to, uh, to complement and uh, provide other functions deeper on the work uh, that we did. And uh, from that, we have already published a paper. Uh, I think uh, most of the other items we can discuss uh, uh, as we move along, because we are around the team tomorrow evening. So uh, meet me and I will give you a lot of information about it. The paper is uh, called Factors in Raising and settlement of pastoralism in So I have it, it's a good look. And uh, the way to go is to address this issue and 
the way to go is to avoid overseeing other, other areas. At the same time, we expect that they will not change. Things are changing and we are losing a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. I think if you are really interested in understanding more about the animal resources, there is the Inter-African Bureau of Animal Resources called the AUIBA, and that's where you get the conference for pastoralists. So we might not bring the Madarse Mardi, but if you are interested in the animal resources, please follow AUIBA, Inter-African uh, Bureau for Animal Resources. Is an African Union body in charge of livestock and pastoralists. That will be useful. That's then. I don't know if you have a response on the biodiversity question. Whether Uganda is among the members who committed to the 3030. Please, a quick one. Then we close. No, no, I'm actually not aware if Uganda is committed to 30 by 30 or not. I really appreciate the question and and, and agree very much. I think that the goal, um, even to your point, having quoted the loss in forest forested areas in Uganda. I think the goal for these technologies is to support better decision making and more transparency about how the world is changing. Um, so how can we how can we provide policymakers and decision makers with real data about what's going on to advise discussion and policy? Um, that, that's about that's about all I can offer, right? That is to focus on enabling technology and trying to provide better uh, information to support decision making. Okay, thank you very much for having attended this session. It's been a long one. I think it was almost the last two groups you are remaining. The other two presenters didn't make their presentations. Hopefully you will get them in the final uh, conference book when it is ready. And when the full papers are basically submitted to us, then you'll have the conference material available through PDF format. So kindly follow up on the RIC website sometimes later to find out the complete Photography, abstracts, as well as uh, full materials. I think uh, this is one of the well-attended uh, thematic areas. Very large number. You're more than, I think, over 50, or over 50. And thank you very much for being patient and taking part in this particular session. From this juncture, then I will allow you then to proceed to have your tea, and then have a cocktail. So if you don't see the cock, don't take the tail. <laughs> okay, but in case you're able to see the cock, please touch the tail. They think are all being served at the same place, same tea area. So you make your taste. If you are not a cock person, go for the tail. Thank you and enjoy your evening. As well as astronomy, as, as well as satellite development. An interesting one is the last one where we are working with one of the startups called Sayari Labs. Uh, there was, I saw a representative from them uh, in, in this forum, and we're hoping that we'll have uh, another satellite launch. The one that I mentioned earlier, the orbited in, um, in June 2020 <coughs> after being in orbit for two years. And we have one ex uh, engagement that we're currently undertaking uh, in terms of catalyzing, and this is targeted for the startups. So we have the African Earth Observation Challenge. It's, it's an African challenge. It has a number of players within the, the ecosystem from South Africa, Sansa, Maxa, Digital Earth Africa is also supporting, uh, among its other stakeholders. But the idea is to try and catalyze and, 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 and engage the, the upcoming startups uh, so that we also extend the opportunities. Uh, feel free to visit the website. The website is up there. The deadline for submission is uh, 19th. The areas that we're focusing on is uh, Climate change, smart cities, mining, logistics, and uh, agriculture. So if you have an application that you're working on that, uh, visit this, uh, the website because there are the number of support systems that will be put in place, including training, that will come to the fore. And we're hoping that we'll have this happening during the Kenya Innovation Week, the pitching of the best institutions. I want to stop there to allow the other presentation to make, but again, thank you for this opportunity at RCMRD, and we hope that we will continue engaging. We don't have all the solutions, and we hope to engage with you to tell us where you would think we want to come in as an agency. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Hazel Washira um, from Kenya Ways. Um, I'm an engineer by profession. I'm also the head of training at uh, Fahari Aviation. So I teach uh, people how to fly drones, okay? 
Uh, I'll just be making a short presentation about uh, Fahari Aviation. I'm um, sure most of you have were the team that attended the uh, the demo that we did yesterday are familiar with uh, what we do, but just to go through uh, other things that we do around Fahari Aviation for uh, your consumption. Okay, so Fahari Aviation is a fully owned subsidiary uh, of Kenya Airways Group. So just like you hear Kenya Airways Cargo, you hear about Jumbo Jet, you hear about Training School, all those are small companies within the Kenya Airways Group. Uh, and Fahari Aviation was formed in uh, 2020, just when uh, the regulations around drone technology were released by the authority, that's KCAA. And our mandate is to deliver solutions around emerging technologies. Okay? So drone technology is just one of the technologies that we're looking at. We have others that we're also looking at. I'll give a short video at the very end and you'll be able to see some of the futuristic aviation technologies that we're looking at within fire aviation. But a uh, major part of the presentation will be around drone technology. Okay. So in Fahari Aviation, we say the future of living. This is what we say in Fahari Aviation. And the idea is that um, when we look at emerging technologies, especially, um, for example, drone technology, when you look at the future, drone technology will be part of every single part of your living. You talk about agriculture. We'll have drones doing crop spraying, we'll have drones doing precision agriculture. You talk about uh, transport. We'll have drones delivering um, medical supplies, drones doing um, certain logistics uh, within the transport system. When you talk about um, communications, there are drones that provide internet connection. And you can name so many industries. So when you look at the future, we see the drone, drone technology integrating with the, our living. So that's why we see it is the future of living, okay? So this is just a snapshot of um, the, um, our, um, how we started in 2020, I just explained that. Um, as of now, we are already certified as a full um, KCA approved operations uh, unit, and we are also a training unit. So we provide services around uh, operations and training that I'll talk about in my next slide. Um, we also have a facility that we call a drone cage in a drone club. Um, that the drone cage allows anyone who has a drone and wants to practice or wants to test their drone, then you can come to our facility and you can be able to use it for such purposes. We have a club open to students, open to members who want to join the club and learn more about drone technology or other futuristic technologies um, and share ideas with others. Um, the, the registration is available through uh, our website, so you can visit our website and you'll find more details there. Uh, around enterprise solutions that we offer, we do also offer consultancy for anyone who wants to set up their own organization or wants to train um, or wants to import a drone or anything drone related. We do offer such services. Um, Looking at 2023 and beyond, we are looking at getting into maintenance, um, last mile deliveries, US traffic management, and beyond, um, we are looking at things we call urban air mobility. As I mentioned, I will talk about some futuristic technologies towards the end of my presentation. We are also looking at manufacturing. Um, and drone ports, and this will assist in enhancing the benefits of uh, drone technology within the region. So our mission in, um, in Fahari Aviation is to transform African communities through sustainable technologies, such as the emerging uh, technologies like drone technology. Um, and I mentioned before, we intend to create the future of living. Okay. We have three main pillars within Fire Vision. We have the operations unit, um, the traffic management unit, which essentially supports our training division and our operations division, and we have the training division. So some of the solutions that we offer around operations, um, we include services around 
monitoring and surveillance, uh, aerial mapping and survey, inspections, agriculture, for those who saw the demo yesterday, um, conservation, photography and videography, and emergency response. As my colleague mentioned, there are so many, many, many varied um, applications of drone technology, but these are our key focus um, for, um, for fire vision. Okay? Um, in the near term, we're looking at beyond visual line of sight. This is highly dependent on a traffic management system that the regulator is working on. Uh, we're also looking at last mile deliveries. We have technical partners that we are working with to be able to enhance this uh, last mile deliveries. Um, maintenance and repair services as well for the drones. Distributorship, this is already open. Um, I think we'll make an announcement later, but for anyone who wishes to import a drone, we are a fully approved uh, DGI um, distributor, so we can be able to assist you in importing and commissioning any DGI drone for private use or for enterprise use. Um, and lastly, air, uh, urban air mobility. Um, other services we offer around operations department include data processing and management. Um, looking at the various key service areas and consultancy, as I mentioned. So, snapshot, snapshot of our operations workflow includes um, capturing data image, which is the first part. You know, we spent uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about data capture uh, from various sources. We focus on drone technology, and then we process these images. We scout. We analyze and then we share in whatever format that the client requires us to share it. Then for our training solutions, um, they range from um, initial training, that is your RPL training, all the way to advanced training. So you're looking at remote pilot license for the multi-rotors, the ones that have propellers like this and they hover. Those are the multi-rotors. takes about two to three weeks to do that course. And then you have the fixed wing, uh, which takes about three to four weeks. We also do sensitization training for anyone who wants uh, a team to be sensitized on what these machines are and what they can do, and ETC for companies and individuals, and awareness training as well. Moving on to advanced training. Now, this advanced training includes flying beyond where you can see, meaning I'm seated here behind a machine and my drone is flying and it's going all the way to Mombasa and it's doing whatever it needs to do, and then it comes back. Now, to do that course, you need to get the BV loss um, course uh, rating, which is beyond visual line of sight. We do offer this course. Um, however, this has been reserved by the regulator because of a uh, they are still working on a traffic management system that will enable them to see where you are. Until that is possible, then that, ha that has been reserved. But they've indicated that come January 2023, this will be available. So for anyone who wants to do uh, drone operations commercially, might be the right time to get your RPL so that you have sufficient experience by the time we are open for the BV loss. Payload courses um, are around what the drone can do. Uh, remember, drones are just essential tools for data collection or whatever use. So whatever the drone is intended to do is what we call payload course, okay? So it could be a surveillance mission, it could be a mapping mission, it could be aerial photography, yeah? What the drone carries, the payload, is essentially what um, the mission is tied to the mission, okay? So we do offer such courses. For example, if you want to do, become a drone pilot, but you want to specialize on mapping. With drone pilot, you want to specialize on inspections or aerial photography. That is still possible. And others include recurrent training, um, because the, the training that we offer is a licensed course. Um, you require to be refreshed every other time. It's not for life. So you come back to school after some time and we refresh you a little bit, tell you what's new on air law, what's new on airspace, what's new in navigation, what's new in radio, and then now we test your proficiency and then we can release you. So we do that, we offer that, um, a refresher courses and uh, maintaining currency um, and also instructors training if you wish to become an instructor just like myself. 
Okay, uh, solutions around um, UAS management, this relates mostly to large, um, large drone operators. This uh, could be individual small companies to very big companies. So if you have a fleet of drones or you wish to acquire a fleet of drones, you need a way to manage that fleet. You need a way to manage your personnel and you need a way to manage your data. So this is a solution that we also offer because it can get very, very cumbersome to, um, to manage all that, especially from an operations point of view. When you have pilots flying all over the place, um, you require some sort of um, network that you can be able to manage. So those are services that we offer around UAS management. Uh, I will not talk a lot about drones for mapping and surveying because I think we, we spoke a little, um, we spoke quite a lot yesterday and we also were present during the demo um, that we did yesterday. But these are some of the drones that we have for uh, mapping and surveying purposes. And these are the capabilities. Um, you can visit the booth and learn more about the payload that each drone carries and the capability that it has. I just displayed two of the drones that we have. Some of the projects that we have uh, engaged in include the first one, that's a proof of concept that we did with Kenjan. Uh, this was around use of drone technology for inspections of substation and uh, in power lines, so we did that in uh, 2020, 2021, yeah. And um, the power companies are looking at um, exploring the use of this, not only for substation, they're also looking at transmission lines and um, distribution lines. Um, the one above is one I spoke about yesterday, that's the aircraft inspection project that we're doing with one of our key aircraft stakeholders, that is Boeing Next. Below it is um, uh, Fire Aviation participating in the KWS National Sensors in 2021, use of drones to assist in counting of animals. Um, the one right below is uh, Sassini, um, that is use of drones for agriculture, specifically crop spraying, uh, spreading and seeding. The one uh, on the next column, top above, that's a display of our drone cage. Right below is um, our class, one of our students attending class. And right below is our drone cage facility that I talked about that is located right within a controlled area. So the benefits of having this drone cage is that as you're flying, uh, you're able to still be within that radio range. So you're able to interact with tower, able to interact uh, with the airspace that is near you. So it gives you a very good learning experience. The location is right next to the airport. So it's, it's confined, but within a good area for you to be able to learn. Uh, right below, we're looking at um, trainees from uh, Kenya Revenue Authority, they're looking at exploring drones for border control and uh, surveillance and also for asset mobilization for tax returns. So right next to drone, right below that is uh, an engagement uh, during the, the oil carrier uh, inspection. Then right below you can see our former president there also operating one of our drones. is a very big fan of drone technology. As you can see, this was during the Magical Kenya event. And the one below is one of, it's an artistic impression of our futuristic um, technology around EV tolls, which I will talk about in the next slide. Okay, so we are looking at transforming the African trade um, as one of the biggest stakeholders in um, air transport. We are looking at how to enhance this in the future. So there's something that we're looking at, the technology around air mobility that we're looking at. So we're imagining that in the future what we'll have, we'll, instead of having helicopters moving um, our politicians or anyone around, yeah, or the rest of us, yeah, we will have such vehicles that we're calling e-vitals that will be able to move people from place to place. And that way, aviation um, and flight will, not, will be accessible to everyone, okay? Just like 
Uh, just a few years ago, uh, electric cars were only accessible to very few, but now it's becoming a little more common. So we are seeing a future like that. You would be able to take an EVTOL, get into an EVTOL, and go to Kisumu and come back just the way you request for an Uber or you request for a boat. Yeah. So we envision that kind of transport for the future. Okay. And this will require a lot of engagement from different stakeholders. Um, and it will also require us to set up certain um, design car requirements at this moment into our regulations to be able now to execute that for, uh, for the future. So I will display a short video that will... Um, will depict how Nairobi will look at, will look like in the future um, in terms of air mobility and um, the future of transport. Okay. that we're working with uh, one of our partners called Eve to see that um, happen in the future for African communities. Um, the intention is to, at this moment, we're part of the working group and the intention really is to be able to drive our agenda from the root, from the design phase. We are the ones who understand the issues uh, around our African continent. So if we can be able to get those, um, those key um, requirements into the design phase, then we are the ones who are going to benefit the most. So that is the, um, the, the reason why we are, uh, we have a, we're putting a big focus on um, urban air mobility, especially for um, the African continent. Um, I think I'll display this for Harry Fleet. Most of you have seen uh, our drones at the booth and uh, during the demo. There are contacts there for anyone who has any questions about what we do um, and any of the services that we offer or you have um, any interest in, um, in joining us, um, you can reach out to us through those contacts. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm in the forestry sector. Uh, similar to how you did a census on wildlife, I wanted to know if you can also carry out an inventory on forest and trees using the drones. 
Wetten wird. I work with the Wildlife Research and Training Institute, a subsidiary of uh, Kenya Wildlife Service. I think I was uh, present when uh, KQ was demonstrating the use of a uh, drone in uh, counting wildlife in circles. Yeah, um, I know that uh, technology is very expensive. Adoption of technology is very expensive, especially in a third world country like Kenya, which is experiencing very many problems, including a uh, shortage of uh, maize and uh, <laughs> the cost of it. So one of the issues I really want you to probably, together with the Kenya Space Agency and the uh, KQ, would be if you say something on the cost and financing. And number two is uh, there is also the issue of uh, geopolitics in uh, space uh, technology. Which way do we go? Do we go west? Do we go China? Thank you. Mr. Okay, I'm from Malawi. Uh, we bought several uh, drones for Mapi, but uh, we don't have uh, people with licenses. There's a school in Malawi which trains people to have licenses in drone flying, but they only take uh, people who are 25 years and younger. Well, in our mapping section, uh, most of us are very old. So can this be offered to people like us uh, from other countries? Thank you. This data sets and uh, how is uh, the data sets from uh, that uh, satellites, uh, how, how, how can they be accessed and how are they being used? Thank you. My name is Joseph Bogua from a survey from Kenya Rural Homes Authority. Uh, I'm is interested in uh, this drone uh, inspection of the critical infrastructure. Uh, we, we, have, we may have problems of uh, structures like bridges where we need to inspect the underside of it to tell whether there is any deformation and such things for monitoring purposes. How do I go about that? Uh, is it able to, to pick the photo from the other side of those structures? Thank you. Let us have the responses so that we don't mix it with the other presentations. Uh, you started. Take it up. Whether we need to look east or west, um, I think our, our mandate requires us to look both sides. It depends on what we want to get and how um, the cost element. Uh, so we're looking at the market forces. So if you have a need high resolution imagery like has been presented in other forums, so we look for those providers that are able to provide us that information at a reasonable cost. I also wanted to comment on, there was a question on forest, although it was directed towards the, uh, uh, the, the, the presentation on drones. Uh, again, drones or satellites are essentially platforms. What you the, the, the ultimate is the data that is collected and be able to get to uh, maybe listen to the other presentation up to 30 centimeter, um, 50 centimeter, which allows you to see uh, an individual tree. So still be able to collect that. Of course, drones also are able to provide you that kind of high precision. But again, drones might not be as effective if you want to cover a large geographical <coughs> area, that's why we need uh, satellite imagery because you're able to cover a much more extensive area. Uh, and again, of, of course, if you want to go back in time again, satellite imagery comes in handy. And you try to provide that, uh, or to pro uh, be able to provide that um, uh, solution or to s support the industry within that particular aspect. I think those are the main questions that were directed to us. Oh, there was a question regarding the data for, for icons. It was a technology demonstration project. So the camera that was there was a two megapixel camera. Uh, again, it was a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter satellite, so it's not a big one. Uh, but usually the technologies in terms of 
how you're able to take an image up there and send it to the ground station. There is no 3G or 4G out there. So you normally use uh, the rudimentary technology that, that was using radio frequency signals to send an image. And that takes a bit of time. And again, because the satellite is going round and round the earth, uh, the only window that you normally get is about like varies, depending five to 10 minutes for you to be able to send that data to the ground station. And that window is usually quite small. Uh, it deorbited, so it's no longer being used. Uh, in, it, it was only in orbit for two years. And that's why we are looking to have one that is that has a commercial value uh, that we can use for applications, and uh, more information will come in when we know. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, I think we had the majority of questions, so I'll try and um, I'll take the time allocated. Um, so the first one was drones for counting trees. I think my uh, colleague here from Kenya Space Agency has alluded, answered a little bit. But yes, the, uh, drone satellites are da data collection tools. So what matters is really what, how you process that data. Okay. So if you mount a payload that that is able to um, to do the mapping, then you are able to process that data and get. Um, the specific asset. It could be trees, it could be buildings, whatever asset it is. So it is possible, obviously within um, the required scope of work. The second one was about financing. Um, is there financing around use of drone technology? I would assume this is with regards to organizations, companies. So we are working with um, with funding organizations to see how that is possible, especially for companies that want to explore a drone technology for social use, for economic purposes, for government purposes. So we're working with organizations to, uh, to see this. Um, and if you have any specific need, you can, um, you can, uh, you can see myself uh, after this meeting and we can discuss the specific challenges you have around financing. In terms of the costs, um, we have seen drones providing up to 60% less um, the cost. But what you what you normally see is about uh, 40 to 60% in terms of cost effectiveness when you compare to traditional methods. Obviously, this I'll put a disclaimer. It depends on how you deploy the technology, um, and it also depends within the boundaries of the scope. So whatever is required also determines uh, the cost of the technology. Um, in terms of training, there's a question on training sponsorship. Um, at the moment, we are not offering any training sponsorship, uh, but we're looking at this um, for 2023. Um, you were specific for international organizations. So at the moment, uh, Fire Aviation is able to convert international licenses to Kenyan licenses. So that is what is available. Um, but in terms of sponsorship at this moment, um, that is not available. Um, there was a question on infrastructure inspection. Are we able to do this? Yes, the drone is able to do infrastructure inspection. And this is um, just uh, to go through the workflow, this is what happens. As you are taking an image, um, uh, the images are uploaded onto the software, and the software is integrated with AI technology, such that once um, the image is uploaded, then you're able to know that there is a defect. For example, um, if you talk about a pole, you have a defect on a pole, there's corrosion, there's a missing cap, there's that, and all that is captured and it is noted. Okay, so there is implementation of both the data collection part, but also there's a data processing, and then the other technologies in the background. But yes, we are uh, working on uh, a, a specific project with uh, Kenya Power on the same. They're looking at inspection of uh, power lines using drones. Okay, um, precision of drones in surveying. Okay, so now drones. Um, come in a very special niche uh, when you look at uh, surveying and mapping application. So um, as my colleague mentioned, if you want to map the whole of the world or you want to map Africa, then you probably go for satellite. But there is a certain niche that 
you will require or a drone would actually be more beneficial. You're looking at three hectares to about 100 hectares, yeah? That specific niche is where now drone technology complement other, other data collecting services. Now, you're looking at precision. Sometimes precision is too expensive, yeah? Sometimes you do not need that millimeter to make a decision, that millimeter precision, yeah? But drone technology provides high resolution up to the millimeter. So for that specific requirement, then drone technology is useful, okay? So in terms of our precision in surveying, that also depends on the data processing that you're going to do after. Remember, drones are just the data collection tool. Um, and then international collaboration, yes, we are open to partnering with uh, universities, partnering with other companies, technical companies, um, whichever company that is um, willing to work with us to front this technology. As I mentioned, our mission really is to transform African communities. So we are focused on each community one by one. It doesn't have to be the whole of Africa, but communities. So if um, you, um, you're part of an organization and wants to work with Vario Vision, we're very, very open to work and collaborate with you. Okay. And if I haven't answered your question uh, comprehensively, you can see me after. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. My name is Cecilia R. Ramahasebe. From CSIR, Council for Scientific Industrial Research in South Africa, head of this in But the work that I'm going to present is the work that uh, we did for ICPAC with the ACIPS. I think we have an uh, ACIP director here, Dr. Jane. The work is on, uh, we're trying to develop a system for monetary and predictive rangeland um, quality, quantity and trust status in Eastern Africa. <coughs> I just want to acknowledge um, four authors. It's me, it's Moses Shaw, who's my current uh, manager at CSIR, and Dr. J and the rest in their company. Okay, this is just an outline. First, uh, the reason why this uh, work is important is because we are growing as a population and we need food. Not only us, but even animals. However, especially in Africa, we, we know that Africa is prone to drought or climate consequences. Uh, like drought, for example, in 2015, Southern Africa, we had a, a severe drought around 2015 and 2016. So therefore, there's a need for at least a uh, system that will be able to help us to prepare. <coughs> These are the objective, or was the objective of the project. Uh, first, we wanted to develop a early warning system based on uh, satellite data. To develop, first to develop uh, indicators for monitoring and assessing rangeland condition using free available EO data, satellite data. To develop method for forecasting rangeland condition. And to develop a function online model application for assessment, monitoring and predicting rangeland condition. So I'm going to only present on uh, development of uh, biomass as well as forecasting biomass because that's the work that I, I was, I was um, that I did with uh, Moses Shaw. This is the methodology we first extracted data, satellite data. We used mainly uh, Google Earth Engine from Google Earth Engine, and then we must. Um, our study area, you can see that is the eastern part of, of um, Eastern Africa. And then we applied our statistical uh, or processing, and then after that we send the data, the product, to the web portal. <coughs> this is just a, another method that's a detailed framework. 
uh, we use mini modis, uh, chips data, and also the surface soil moisture, I mean <laughs> moisture. And then after that, you, uh, we process the data, we analyze the data, and these are the products. And I'm just going to focus on, on this, the, the one we within um, red uh, block, because uh, those products are um, the one who produce them, and then from there, we send the data to the web portal. First, I'll present uh, the methodology for uh, rainflake condition. So we computed yearly, first we computed yearly uh, from 2020, 2000 to 2020, following the method proposed by Weber 2010. Uh, I'll provide a link if you want to maybe go through the, the paper publication. Uh, that method computes range condition scores from normalized um, different vegetation index, NDVI, and using moving standard deviation index, MSDI. So MSDI was computed using moving window of five by five, because we use MODIS, which was 1.2 meters by 1.2. And the annual condition score was determined following the criteria below uh, is uh, in the next uh, slide. This is the criteria that we used to actually uh, characterize uh, those um, conditions. And then this is the product and you can see that the one, which is red, uh, shows that the arrangement there is um, transformed or degraded. And then we have two, which is good condition, <coughs> untransformed in terms of untransformation. And then we have uh, three, which is good condition, fresh transformed. And then we have four, which is good condition, which is fresh and transformed. And then about the, that methodology, if you want to go maybe to understand the methodology, you can contact me after. And then I'll be able to explain. And then now I'm going to uh, present the methodology we followed for, for <coughs> our biomass quantification. We also used the MODIS <coughs> for this one. Uh, first, we it, we used time series for also from 20... 2021 uh, images. Uh, this time we used 250 because you know that mod is uh, this is the actually the smaller size pixel size or maybe the highest resolution from mod is. And the images, so like I said, we downloaded the images from Google Earth Engine automatically from uh, Google Earth Engine using uh, Google Earth uh, Python API. <coughs> And then we scaled the data after that, and then we used what we call a radiative transfer model. It's uh, called Procell. Procell is another type of uh, radiative transfer model that we use, it's the 1D model. So that uh, model, we use it to, to convert, I mean, to actually uh, calculate or uh, estimate a leaf area index. And then after that, the leaf area index was uh, converted into um, biomass. This is just an outline of the same thing, but I just want to graphically to show uh, what we did. Uh, like I said, extracted NDVI, and then we used um, <coughs> a Procell to estimate leaf area index. And then that is the model that we used. And then after that, the area index, we used that model and then to, to come up with actually with uh, biomass. Uh, it's the same thing, just explaining the, 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 that um, wave flow or flow diagram. And then after that, uh, our another objective, uh, it was to actually produce focus the, or to focus the biomass, uh, dry as well as uh, fresh biomass. Maybe you're asking yourself, what is uh, fresh biomass and dry biomass, or how did we actually produce those uh, products, fresh and dry biomass? 
fresh dry biomass we just uh, used uh, NDVI that was uh, collected or image that was collected during uh, peak productivity and dry biomass was collected during dry season, wet season and dry season. So for our forecasting data, we followed the same, but we used uh, rainfall data. We first uh, developed a um, forecast NDVI. So we forecast NDVI using a forecast um, uh, uh, rainfall data. And then after that NDVI, we followed the same procedure where we used a ProSail or the Additive Transfer Model to actually come up with the leaf area index. And then after leaf area index, and then we used the same model that I demonstrated previously to uh, come up with um, biomass. This is just an explanation on how we came up with that model, the, the, the uh, forecast model. And this is the model that we used to actually to, the, I mean, the outcome of that uh, procedure when we do, we come up with forecast biomass, I mean, forecast model to estimate the NDVI. Uh, this is just to explain that the, the uh, rainfall data that we used, forecast rainfall data, was from uh, IGPEC. If you go to IGPEC website, you're able to retrieve uh, their estimated or forecast rainfall data. So we used that rainfall data to come up with NDVI, and after that, <coughs> we converted NDVI to leaf area index, leaf area index to biomass. And this one is just to show you the accuracy of that uh, NDVR. This is actually NDVR uh, for March uh, 2020, and that one is the NDVR that we, we produced using a forecast model. You can see R squared is 0 0.82, and normalized uh, root mean square error is 0 0.23. So uh, the model actually uh, was uh, accurate. And this is just a flow diagram, the same one, but this one is for focus, just to show that instead of using a real NDVI from Google Earth Engine, we used uh, NDVI from, I mean, the one that we predicted using uh, forecast rainfall. <coughs> and this is the product, uh, forecast product that we produced. Uh, it was in March 2021, April, and then this is, um, I think this is January, February, and then March, April, actually, uh, the date there. So, okay, it's January, February, March, and April. So this is the predicted, actually, biomass. And the accuracy between predicted, because we also used uh, actual, after actual um, NDVI, and the accuracy was also above 0 0.8 R squared. And all this data was sent to the portal. This is just the front end of the portal that was developed by <coughs> one of our colleagues. So all the data then was sent to this portal. And this is just the front end of the portal. I just I don't have a URL. If you go to uh, APEC, you'll be able to access, um, I mean, to, to go to this portal. And then we have data. And yeah, even biomass data is there. Conclusion is that um, the tool makes it possible to monitor range of condition, also by looking at other indicators. If you go to the URL, and then you'll be able to see other indicators. And the data shown in the range of tool can help users to monitor drought range of condition as well as uh, to show anyone or to yeah to to warn, especially forecast uh, data. <coughs> And like I said, this uh, product we produced using or developed using um, MODIS. We currently actually using Sentinel because you know that Sentinel has a higher special resolution compared to to MODIS, and also the accuracy will increase as compared to MODIS. Thank you. That's the end.